I'm a medical student at Bards, a medical and dental school here at Queen Mary's University in London. I want to specialize and become a consultant in obstetrics and gynecology, and that requires a very particular area of study. But for almost every medical student in the UK, the first year of study is pretty much the same. And one of the things we all do at some point during that first year is something called procession. Procession is sort of like dissection in that you're dealing with dead bodies and stuff, only instead of dissection, where you're chopping up an entire body procession is when the dead body has already been chopped up by an experienced anatomist so that medical students can study its anatomical structure. About three times a year, we'll put on our white coats, along with a pair of goggles and latex gloves. And then we'll head down into the basement where all the cadavers are kept, and study specific parts that are laid out on those big metal tables. This is basically like a circuit of looking at each organ or body part for about 10 minutes before moving on to the next. It's definitely one of the grimmer things we do during the first year of medical school. And if you've even got an ounce of squeamishness in you, one or two perception sessions are enough to squash that out of you. So a couple of days after my second procession session, first year, I received a generic email from a department head stating that all processions will be cancelled for the foreseeable future. I didn't really take much notice of it. My next session probably wasn't going to be for another few months. So I figured it wouldn't apply to me. But that wasn't exactly the case. Because a few days after I got the email, I got a knock on my room in the halls of residence. And when I opened it up, there was a female police officer, stood in the threshold. She very politely explained that the halls of residence had given the Met Police permission to search my room. But she wanted to be polite and asked if I minded if a few other officers called by in the next half hour or so to have a little look around my room. Obviously I had nothing to hide, and my room was like the size of the cupboard. So of course I consented. She thanked me and moved on before two other officers called by a short while later, only this pair had a sniffer dog with them. Like I said, I had absolutely nothing to hide. So I just stood there politely while the officers ran the dog around the small interior of my room. It had a little sniff around I mean for like 10 seconds, tops then they to thank me for my cooperation and then moved on. But not before I asked them if they could tell me what was going on. One of the officers apologized and told me they weren't allowed to talk about it. But they were sure the university would mention something to us soon enough. Only they didn't. Weeks went by and we were pretty much left to just assume that since there was a sniffer dog involved, that the whole police search was because someone in the halls was suspected of drug dealing or at least having drugs in their room. Students and drugs go together like a horse and carriage. So assuming it was something drug-related, it seemed perfectly logical. But we were wrong. Because the real reason the rooms were searched was far darker, and considerably more disturbing than just a few bags of weed or something. Now, I can't actually confirm this, and I don't have any solid evidence for what were essentially rumors that went around. But someone apparently high up in the anatomy department went off the record and told a student that the cancellations of the procession sessions and the sniffer dog search were linked. Apparently someone had stolen a specimen from the basement during the session I was in. It was something that had happened once or twice over the years, someone had pilfered a preserved heart or a skull, but in this case, an entire head had gone missing from the basement. And the potential for scandal was phenomenal. None of this ever ended up in the papers or in the news. So many that was just rumors that couldn't be confirmed. But I also heard that Bartz was forced to make a huge out-of-court settlement with someone that same year, and that a non-disclosure agreement and high court injunction had been put in place. Honestly, that could have been over literally anything, student misconduct, or some other kind of scandal yet. I can't help but connect the dots from the rumors and the search to the payout in the injunction. I really do think someone stole a human head from the basement somehow. But whether or not it was a student or a member of staff, I'm not sure. And why ever anyone would want to do that? It's just beyond me. I'm really not sure I want to know why someone would want to steal a preserve head from an anatomy lab, 
or what they do with it once they did, but it's also pretty frightening that Bart seemed more concerned in covering things up and sweeping things under the rug than really getting to the bottom of what happened, or keeping us informed. I'd consider doing more digging if the whole thing didn't leave such a bad taste in my mouth. And like I said, the whole thing raises questions that if I'm honest, I'm not sure I really want to know the answers to, and so I just have to live with it. Live with the fact that one of my fellow students could have stolen a human head headed away somewhere, and are now using it for some truly sickening, perverse things. I go to uni here in Leicester in the UK, and like most students, I'm out clubbing every weekend that I can afford it. I've had some of the best nights of my life with the girls in Leicester City Centre, but I'm not gonna lie. I've seen some really hard things to from girls weighing themselves, whether to drunk to stand to bar fights where rabid lads were whipping bottles at each other. I think alcohol has the ability to bring out the absolute worst in people. And it was on a night out in Leicester that one of the scariest things I've ever been part of were witnessed to happen right in front of me. So we're leaving the club on Saturday night, planning on stumbling over the road to the kebab house to get ourselves some cheesy chips. When we see this girl sitting outside the club looking absolutely rotten drunk. The poor thing can barely keep her eyes open and it doesn't look like anyone there is looking after her, which was honestly a little bit concerning. But the kebab place we ended up sitting down and had these big glass windows that looked out into the street. So from my window seat, I could still keep my eyes on her. Like I might choose the chips and I'm sitting there eating them when I see this lad walk up to her who takes her by the hand and then starts trying to get her to stand up. I was really relieved at first because I thought her boyfriend had showed up to take her home. But the longer I looked, the more I just got this bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. Not only was this girl just refusing to go with the sky when she had every reason to want to get home and out of the cold. But the guy was like looking over her shoulder and looking around like he didn't want people to see what he was doing. You know, making sure the coast was clear something. It was such an obvious sign of guilt and I could just tell that something wasn't quite right. Eventually, the guy just pulls the girl up to her feet while she weakly struggles and fails to shake them off. And then he starts dragging her away from the club and into the middle of the street. I started learning my mates this, and immediately, we all get up from the table where it grabbing our boxes of chips and heading out into the street to confront the guy. We rush over intended to give it our best British passive-aggressive, excuse me, do you know her went out of like nowhere, this car rushes up and breaks violently next to the pair of them. But in doing so, one of the front wheels like runs over the girl's foot and she lets out this kind of dowel of pain. Then as the guy drags her around the side of the car that we're approaching, we see her foot like flopping around in this really unnatural way where her ankle is really obviously broken. The guy then starts to basically bundle the girl into the back of the seat that had at least three other guys in it. We only just catch him in time to try to stop it. Or asking if he knows her, and asking if the girl if she's alright, insisting he needs to call an ambulance for her right that instant. He starts trying to tell us that everything's okay. And then he knows her is going to take her to an accident emergency, to have her foot looked at. One of my mates asked him what her name is, and he sort of freezes hesitates, and pulls some random name out of his but in a way that made it painfully obvious that he didn't know her before he walked up to her just a few minutes before we start going mad, like telling him we're going to call the police if he doesn't let her go. And this gets the other lads in the car really agitated, who start barking at him to get the girl in the car, which he does, almost violently, before the car starts to drive away. I'm trying to get the car's number plate, while one of my mates is on the phone to the police, but I can't make it out properly. So for one horrible moment, I thought that was it. That something terrible was going to happen to that girl and we've totally just failed to stop it. But I turn around and my other two friends are piling into a hackney cab screaming, get in Chloe. Then what followed was legit like a movie, made his own like follow the car, and then we're off whizzing around Leicester city center following this black Volvo with the lads and the injured girl inside. As we're following it. It's just chaos in the back of the cab. One of my mates is still on the phone to the police, telling them what's going on. Another one of my mates is giving the cab driver, the lowdown on the situation. 
All the while I'm noting the fact that the lads don't seem to be driving anywhere near the local A&E. They're actually headed out of the city center towards the suburbs, which to me, was a pretty good indicator that we're trying to take her somewhere dark and secluded to do only God knows what to her. My mate got off the phone with the police and told us that they told her that they had a unit in the area, and they were messing about either. It was like a minute or two before we saw blue flashing lights, and the cab driver pulled his cab back away from the Volvo to let the police slip and pull them over. When they finally do pull over, we all pile out of the cab while the driver waits for us watching what was going on and shouting over and over liar liar when the guy starts telling the policeman that the girl is their friend and that they're taking her home. The other policeman who was there then comes over to us and starts getting our side of the story, which basically involves me telling him everything I'd seen. And now I said it was incredibly suspicious. What happened next all unfolded over the course of like an hour, with more police cars turning up to keep an eye on the lads, while one set of policemen got the girl out of the car and drove her to the hospital. I'm not sure if the lads got arrested or not. But I know they got their details taken down. And no matter what happened after that, I know the girl ended up being taken away from the obvious danger and getting her foot seen to my only real concern then was that the cab driver was going to charge us like an arm and a leg for keeping him occupied for so long. They actually refused to take any money off of us and in the end, saying it was just nice to see some people doing some good in the world. And then when his daughter is our age and gets into any trouble, that it helped there be some good Samaritans like us to help her out. I studied nursing here at the National University of Singapore. I originally trained to be a lab assistant, which here can lead to some very well-paid jobs. But I hated the boring stale environment of working in a lab all day. So I was in a kind of crisis after my first round of university because I just couldn't see myself working in that kind of environment. So I took some time off from my lab assistant job to volunteer with a children's cancer charity which was one of the most enriching, rewarding, and meaningful experiences of my entire life. I won't say too much about it, because I think I might start to cry and mess up my keyboard. But working with those kids meant I had found my calling. And so I went back to university to train to be a nurse, and a pediatric nurse in particular. Obviously, a huge part of learning to become a nurse isn't just sitting in a lecture hall or burying your nose in a book. It's learning practically by actually working in a ward under the supervision of a qualified member of staff. I remember my first time on a pediatric floor. It was honestly hellish. I'm still not quite over the sounds of kids screaming and I don't think it's something I would ever get used to. It's a sound that absolutely makes my skin crawl. Like I tense up and I just can't relax on here it after that first shift I got home and just didn't sleep a wink because every time I nodded off, I would hear the sounds of those children's screams just clawing at the inside of my skull. You never get over it. But you do adjust. And after a while you get so tired from the long night shifts that even if you see some horrific things, you still manage to get some sleep. By far the most memorable time during my university training was the code yellow, we got on the floor one day, myself and my supervising nurse were doing our rounds, checking temperatures, administering meds, and going about doing our general checks and the floor when a voice over the hospital's public address system announced a code yellow. I remember the look of pure terror that appeared on my supervisor's face. Like you think that she'd just been told that a meteor was about to crash into the hospital or something. Her eyes turned big and wide and her breathing quickened, and she immediately stopped what she was doing, before, calmly, ushering me off the floor with her. No code yellow, that doesn't sound too serious, does it? Mean it can't be any worse than a code orange or a code red, maybe even a code black could sound more alarming. BC, that's just the idea of using a code like that. That kind of works in reverse. Your average civilian hears code yellow and doesn't freak out. But that's nurses know what it means, and we know how serious it is. At the time, I didn't know what it meant. And it took until the supervising nurse told me for me to really understand how horrifying it was. Because you see in our hospital wing. 
A code yellow means that a child has gone missing from one of the floors and that all non-essential nursing staff should immediately help in locking down the exits. To ensure that this child can't leave, or rather, in a lot of cases, that the person attempting to take the child away is properly apprehended. It was like a mad rush to secure the floor. But at the same time, we couldn't let anyone know how panicked we're, and how serious the nature of a code yellow is. All I wanted to do was run around like a headless chicken locking all the eggs it says, I had this horrible image of some predators sneaking into one of the floors to kidnap helpless, innocent children to do something unspeakable with every single person I saw carrying a child that wasn't wearing scrubs, got pulled aside by either nursing staff or hospital security, and were thoroughly questioned as to where they were going, what they were doing. Their visitors' badges were scrutinized, and the patient tag on the child's wrist was inspected too. If I wasn't under the watchful eye of my supervisor, I think I've lost my mind with panic. Eventually, it was discovered that the person that had taken the child off the floor without permission, was the divorced parent wanting the kids who hadn't got to see them in a while and had opted to basically steal them out of the hospital as it looked like they were going to miss their a lot of time looking after them. So it wasn't anyone looking to do any harm. But I'm telling you, the incident scared the absolute life out of me and was by far one of the most terrifying moments of my entire nursing career. I just had no idea what was going on. Things went from zero to 100 seconds for me. I'm just glad it wasn't the thing that I feared the most. I've worked as a college campus police officer, we're a branch of law enforcement that doesn't get very much publicity or attention from the general public. But we're just as much law enforcement as any other branch. Police in college campuses is pretty much all I've ever known to because before I trained to be a regular cop, I worked as a campus security officer, which trust me, was considerably easier than doing any actual police work. But it was also considerably more boring too if I'm being honest, I thought it would consist of breaking up crazy parties rescuing hot sorority girls from whatever jam they've gotten themselves into. Maybe even getting a few compliments that are usually directed at a guy in uniform. But nope, all my job consisted of was was walking around campus for like 8 hours a day, just making sure buildings were secure and that the right doors were locked. On top of that, I had very little training and basically no means of defending myself whatsoever. I was constantly worrying about what I'd do if I'd actually ran into any serious criminal activity, but luckily, I never did. But I can't say the same for some other campus security guards. And that's pretty much the whole reason I'm writing this up. Okay, so Virginia Wesleyan University is a small Methodist college in Norfolk, Virginia, with a total population of less than 1,500 students, and back in 2006, it was even smaller than it is now. It's located near Virginia Beach in the Hampton Roads area of the state, which actually has a relatively high crime rate. But the college itself is pretty safe. And historically, there's been very little in the way of trouble there. It's kind of like a little green island of bliss in the middle of an urban concrete sea and the students that attended rarely say anything bad about its except around exam times, back in 2006, didn't have anything resembling a campus police force. Now almost all American colleges have an attachment of uniformed police to keep them safe. But back then, Wesleyan only employed a small number of unarmed security officials to keep the peace. And one of these was a guy named Walter Zakshevsky, known as Wally or Officer Wally among his colleagues in the student body while he was actually from Chicago to begin with. But after joining the U.S. Navy and spending a good chunk of his military career down in Norfolk, it became kind of a home away from home. I know his wife is from the area and the parent moved back to Chicago after he got out of the military. But at 57, when Wally got laid off from a steel industry job in the Windy City and got sick to death of the weather, the couple moved back down to Virginia and while he took up a job as a campus security officer at Wesleyan University, while he has absolutely no experience in security or law enforcement. But I'm guessing the college didn't mind that since he was ex-military and was therefore seen as being disciplined and reliable. He started in July of 2006. And what followed was basically three months of on-the-job training in which while he came to love his new job, 
His only real complaint was how, how hot and humid the campus could be in the summer months, but he grew to love the student population who viewed him as a kind of warm, friendly guardian type figure, someone they could trust and rely on in their time of need. Then on October 11th of that same year, while he was getting ready for his evening shift patrolling the campus, he was wearing his regular uniform consisting of a blue dress shirt, black pants, and a duty belt containing the usual security-type tools and gadgets, and cuffs, bat and flashlight radio, but most certainly no firearm. Many of the other security staff at the college carried pepper spray, but while he wasn't authorized to carry any because of how new on the job he was, it had recently been his and his wife's 34th wedding anniversary, so the pair were particularly in love around that time. So he made sure to give her hugs and kisses, before he headed off to work that evening. According to the records from that night, everything seemed pretty uneventful. It was just a regular shift on the sleepy college campus. Just before 10 p.m. while he apparently made a radio call to the campus security headquarters, informing them that he was about to undertake a routine building check. Security staff regularly checked in with headquarters so that clerks working there could make notes on their movements and activities. But after that call, while he didn't check in again, this was undoubtedly unusual. It certainly wasn't like Wally, the missile radio check. So officials back at headquarters assumed that there had been some kind of radio malfunction, such as loss of signal, this was their final conclusion to not that something bad might have happened so no police were called and no other members of the security team were sent to check anything out. While his evening shift was due to end at 11 p.m. and he usually arrived back at headquarters for a debrief shortly before his shift was due to end so he could properly hand over to the next guy on duty. But that night, while he never arrived back at headquarters, almost a half hour went by and there were still no signs of Wally and it still proved impossible to get in touch with him via the radio network. Naturally, his colleagues began to worry and a handful of security officers took off around campus to try and find him. One of these officers was the shift commander, a guy called Vic Dorsey. Dorsey was checking out the Boy Dining Center at around 11.30 p.m. when a grisly sight greeted him near the entrance. While he was unconscious, lying in a pool of his own blood having received multiple stab wounds around his arms and torso, someone had evidently violently attacked him. And while while he seemed to have attempted to pull out his baton to defend himself, he simply didn't stand a chance. Head of campus security said that when he got the call shortly after Dorsey had found Wally's body, all he needed to hear was the man's tone of voice to know the worst that occurred. Dorsey only managed to get out one word out before he burst into tears. Wally, Virginia Beach Police, were called and who immediately took over the investigation into Wally's murder. One of the first things they did was to confiscate knives from anyone on campus who happened to be carrying on for whatever reason. Even the head of campus security was considered a suspect for the time being, and was made to hand over the small utility knife he kept on his key ring, despite the fact that he wasn't actually present on campus at the time of the murder. Virginia Beach Police Department also demanded that every member of the security team as well as all other employees on campus get down to the local department for interviews and polygraph tests. Every single member of the security team seemed only too keen to cooperate with the investigation, all except one who apparently turned down the polygraph tests out of medical and religious reasons. As a result of lack of witnesses, clues, and CCTV footage, the investigation came up short pretty soon after it was opened up. When I'm hoping my own little analysis will be able to jog someone's memory or convince someone to come forward. Someone must know something. Someone must have seen something. Heck, even if it's the person that actually killed Wally, they should just man up do the right thing and admit what they did. So we can all get a little closure. I mean, I did Wally's job and that legit could have been me out there that night, stabbed to death securing a building from someone that just shouldn't have been there. And that thought alone is enough to give me chills. Personally, I have one main theory that I think explains what happened to Wally that night. Given that the encounter was outside of the dining center where students spend a fair amount of cash on their lunches and other sweet treats. 
A thief may have believed that there might well have been a great deal of cash left in the building overnight. He probably saw Wally recognize the uniform then attacked in the knowledge that while he probably wouldn't be carrying any kind of firearm the college itself might have been considered an easy target for any kind of serious criminal who might have known that there was very little in the way of security presence there. Yet there was absolutely no sign of any kind of breaking or an attempt at forced entry. Nor had the college been the target of any organized burglaries before that time. This has given rise to other theories that some kind of garage or dispute between co-workers led the Wally's death. After all, there was one member of the security team that refused to take a polygraph test. If you ask me, that's probably the most suspicious thing about this entire case. It's also really curious that there was no CCTV footage of the attack. Another member of the security team would have known where the cameras were at and therefore where the best place to attack Wally would be. He had while he was a very popular member of the team, so what could he have done to encourage someone's anger in such a way as almost totally beyond me? In the words of Marion, Zach Sheff, Ski Wally's widow, I just want to ask them why. Why didn't you just leave? Why did you have to hurt him? And perhaps the most tragic thing I've learned about the events surrounding Wally's death is that just a few months before he was murdered, the head of campus security had been asking the college to pony up the cash to hire some actual trained armed police officers. Leo Tarian head of security has pretty much openly admitted that it was hideously unfair to put untrained and unprepared people in a situation that might lead to encounters with armed and violent criminals. But he also puts it out there that the college was vehemently against the hiring of armed off-duty officers on the grounds that it would create a negative atmosphere on campus by frightening the students. After Wally's death, Wesleyan College not only hired enough to the officer, but offered a $25,000 reward out of their own pocket for any information leading to the identification and arrest of Officer Wally's killer. A shadow box containing a photo of Wally is now retired badge and a medal now hangs in the Wesleyan security office with the box bearing the inscription for the ultimate sacrifice. But as sad and tragic as the whole thing is that pales in comparison to the terrifying idea that a man could be killed in such a brutal fashion while at work with one of his own colleagues as perhaps the main suspect, and that still to this day that a single person has been charged or convicted over his murder. We can only hope that Wally and his widow managed to find some measure of peace. It is the morning of March 22, 1975. Helen Tobolsky, a 62-year-old custodian at the University of Notre Dame arrives at 7 a.m. sharp to begin a day's work. She punches her time clock, collects her cleaning supplies from a storage closet, fills up a mop bucket full of warm soapy water, and then walks over to the aerospace engineering building. Unlike today, there were no closed-circuit television cameras on the Notre Dame campus. So we can only make really educated guesses on Helen's movements. That also means we have no definitive record of who else was on the campus, or who might have followed Helen into the aerospace engineering facility. But what we do know for certain is that around two hours later at roughly 9 a.m. Dr. Hugh Ackert, an engineering professor who had been lecturing at Notre Dame for many years arrives on campus. After fetching a morning coffee from the staff lounge, he makes his way over to the aerospace building. He intends to head into the machine shop to ensure everything is in order for the students who will be arriving shortly to begin the practical lessons. He was exhausted and bleary-eyed. Last night he'd been up late working on lesson plans for the week to come. But as he enters the machine shop, he sees something that sends his heart racing and his adrenaline pumping. Lying on the machine shop floor is Helen Tobolsky. She is leaking half-clotted blood from a small gunshot wound to her skull. And written on a nearby blackboard is a date along with four words. February 21, 1975. The day I died. Helen's body was taken to a local coroner's office to be examined by a mortician. Her autopsy revealed that she had been dead shortly after 7 a.m. meaning she had barely begun her cleaning duties when her killer had struck and all likelihood he had been following her around campus from the moment she arrived and picked the first available opportunity to murder her, apparently by shooting her just below her left ear with a small caliber pistol. 
Police discovered the door close to where Helen was found had been forced open with a small glass window having been broken. This means that it is probably the case that the killer was not a member of the university staff. If they were, they would have had the opportunity to get hold of the keys. So the Aerospace Center. Interestingly enough, there were no signs of a struggle or chase. If the killer had broken into the building after Helen was inside it, chances are she would have heard and become startled by the breaking. We can then safely assume that she'd gone to alert campus security and that some kind of pursuit would have ensued. But no, it was an ambush, plain and simple. Therefore, we can safely assume that whoever killed Helen had opted to break into the building before she arrived for work. Most of the other cleaning staff at Notre Dame arrived at 8 a.m. to begin their shifts. But Helen was dedicated to her work and used to arrive an hour earlier in order to earn a little extra pay and get a head start on her duties. The killer knew this, and that shows an alarming degree of premeditation with the killer having made the effort to learn of Helen's movements and habits before choosing the most opportune time and place to kill her. Surprisingly, police initially speculate that Helen had indeed heard the break-in investigating it to surprise a burglar and was killed to ensure she couldn't give an accurate description of them to law enforcement. Hit the building this, suppose that burglar was trying to break into, was one that was full of heavy machinery and large, unwieldy equipment, such as wind tunnels and engines. Hardly the ideal target for a single thief, so unless they were wildly incompetent, we can safely assume the killer was not there to steal. Besides, a golden rule of burglary is never to harm anyone you come across as the police will investigate murder, or assault far more aggressively than simple thievery. Therefore, the likelihood of the incident being a simple robbery gone wrong is very very slim, especially in light of the strange cryptic message that was scrawled on the blackboard near Helen's dead body. The blackboard message was analyzed by handwriting experts in the hopes that it could be confirmed as Helen's, but the results of their investigation were never conclusive. This may well have been because the handwriting on the blackboard drastically different from that of pen on paper, and that she had possibly been forced to write the message under duress. But even then, handwriting experts are trained to be able to work around such differences. And if there indeed had been any major similarities with shape or style of the lettering, they'd have surely mentioned it. Other handwriting samples were taken from other members of university staff, but none were matched to the writing on the blackboard itself. Therefore, we have every reason to believe that it was in fact the killer themselves who wrote the message. However, there is also the issue of the data that was written on the blackboard. The message referenced the date of February 21. While Helen was killed just over a month later on March 22. There was again some rather bizarre speculation that Helen had been forced to write the date herself and had been so afraid of her impending fate that she had simply gotten it wrong. But I believe that it makes much more sense that whoever killed her was trying to reference some kind of perceived slight or insult from Helen that occurred on February 21. This would have meant that the killer had been planning the murder for up to 32 days prior to the event itself. Plenty of time to track Helen's movements and habits in preparation for her murder. But who could Helen have offended so badly that they have been driven to do something as drastic and terrible as take her life? During the course of an extensive police investigation, it was discovered that Helen had no known enemies. She had worked at Notre Dame in her role as custodian for 12 years, seeming to enjoy her job, while each of her co-workers attested that she was very well liked a popular figure among the teaching staff and student body alike. However, there is the possibility that Helen had recently broken it off with a boyfriend or lover, one that had taken it so badly that they consider the day she finished the relationship as the day she died. Helen's husband John had suddenly passed away from an aggressive form of cancer in 1962. And Helen had never remarried. But that doesn't mean she didn't have some kind of male acquaintance at some point, perhaps even more than one. Only one thing is clear regarding Helen's murder that whoever killed her did so out of some twisted desire for revenge, revenge for something that occurred on February 21, maybe even of that very same year. Her slaying was the first ever homicide reported on the Notre Dame University campus, 
and the $5,000 reward was offered by the dean for any information that would lead to the arrest of Helen's killer, but not a soul came forward. As one thing the investigation and established for certain is that no one saw or heard anything suspicious of that fateful morning back in 1975. And even the gunshot that killed poor Helen. 45 years later, Helen's murder remains unsolved. And it's become a piece of forgotten history for Notre Dame. Even in the aftermath of the murder, word of the reward involved for any information occupied only the smallest area of the local newspaper, almost as if no one really cared about the lowly campus custodian who so tragically lost her life. And perhaps this is the scariest thing about Helen's case. Not that she could be stalked, cornered, and killed in such a mysterious and brutal manner, but that her life and death was just a mere footnote to a community that was only too willing to forget and move on.